Okay, we're on. Hello, everyone, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to have uh, Professor Francis uh, with me today uh, on the um, on this Akkad and Coca report. My, um, we're technically incompetent. I couldn't get Dr. Coca on uh, in a three-way format uh, as of yet. But uh, I have uh, Dr. Francis with me. I'm sure most of the uh, the audience will know who you are. Uh, but you're a professor of medicine at uh, Imperial College. Is that right? Correct. That's right. In London. Yes. You know, you are a, a superstar on Twitter. I'm, I'm delighted to have you. You're, you're a, a great teacher. But you are, a, a, you know, a leader in, um, you were the principal investigator in, I think, the trial of the century, the Orbita trial. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you? We should have given you as a reviewer when we applied for funding. Yes, yes, I know, I know. Uh, we'll talk about that after, after this. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, we had a little... Um, uh, conversation on Twitter about EBM, and I've been a long uh, uh, critic, uh, a long time critic of EBM. Mm -hmm. And I think so. Today we decided to just have a conversation, yeah. record it, and share it with uh, the the crowd and see what people think. And so I'll tell you what my beef with EBM is. Uh, I think EBM is incoherent. I think it's superfluous. I think it's potentially harmful. I disagree with the premises of EBM. I disagree with the claims of EBM, and uh, I disagree with the effects of EBM. And so I thought maybe we'll start with the... <laughs> right. So, you know, I could talk for, for an hour, but let me, maybe we should um, stick with, uh, let, should we start with the premises of EBM? Yeah, all right. You know, why don't we say, so, um, and again, it's hard to get, you know, I, I find that the EBM, um, uh, crowd and I don't want to, I don't know if I should include you in that crowd or not but you know they tend to move the goalposts frequently so you can never narrow down a good definition of EBM or what EBM really is because if, if you say EBM is this they say oh no 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 it's not this it's that anyway but the premise of EBM is okay. as far as I understand it is that clinical judgment is fallible you know people get it wrong and you know there are there are biases and so forth and therefore we need to rely primarily or as much as possible on randomized clinical trials to practice medicine or meta-analyses or systematic reviews. So do you agree with that uh, statement? Of so, the, um, I think in some senses, the EBM fanatics are right that we tend to over, there's, there's two elements in this, um, in which uh, they're right in some way, and then the EBM antagonists are right in, in your sense. The, where they are right is that uh, you and I think stents are wonderful and fantastic. And it's really obvious that when we put them in, people get better. It is obvious. And that, that's what I think as well. Um, but partly because we've got into the habit of being taught that way, partly because we spin things when we talk to our patients, and partly because the other people we speak to are people like ourselves, who believe in uh, what we're doing, we end up overestimating our ability to diagnose things and overestimating our ability to treat them. So in that sense, the EBM people are right that it is important to get some kind of confirmation outside personal experience. Um, on the other hand, I think it's wrong to say we can and only practice within the bounds of uh, EBM. So I tend to think of it like if, if I have invited a workman to my, in fact, today I had my washing machine um, replaced in my flat. And the workman came and he opened up all his tools. And I was looking at them and I said, well, I wonder if this spanner here is licensed for use in this Zanussi uh, 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 clothes washing machine. And I thought, Probably not, uh, but has someone ever tested it worked on this model? Probably not, but it probably has worked on something. It may not have to be a washing machine, it could be a car or uh, a trailer, it could be anything. So the tool has actually worked on some task in the past, and I'm willing to extend it to say, okay, go ahead and, and bring it. But if he brings a spanner made out of chocolate, um, and says, oh, this is really good as the latest stuff. I saw it at TCT. There was a sponsored symposium from the chocolate manufacturer. 
tasty chocolate. Wow. <laughs> and uh, he says, I'm going to use it. Has this, have you ever used it on, has anyone ever documented that it actually unscrews the, uh, the bolt? And he goes, no, but you know, it should do because it's so tasty. Um, that's the problem. That's what we're trying to, we're trying to break with EBA. Yeah, but, so, but, but I mean, do you actually need a clinical trial to reject the chocolate branch? In the case that see, the danger isn't uh, uh, chocolate wrenches because they are silly. Uh, the danger is things that sound sensible, because all the damaging things we've done in medicine are stuff that we sound that sound sensible. Because if they didn't sound sensible, we wouldn't do them. Okay, I I I, I agree, but uh, I disagree that in, in the cause when you say we we um, you know we love stance, we tend uh, so I think I I agree with you that there's overuse of of uh, things and 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 practices that are you know uh, uh perpetrated uh, and perpetuated um without without good evidence but i think we're missing the point the the reason stents are overused is not for lack of randomized trials uh about stents uh, the reason our stents are overused is because there are incentives for doctors to use them and and if these incentives incentives were not in place then the doctors would be more circumspect and um, in using them. You know, they'd be, they were more accountable. They'd, uh, but but there's a, there are a lot of systematic problems that have nothing to do with, uh, with knowledge or clinical judgment that have everything to do with uh, um, incentives, lack of, of accountability, and so forth. And I don't see EBM being a remedy to that. And in fact, EBM can go in the opposite direction and... and uh, put uh, medicals on doctors and prevent them from using their judgment in certain circumstances when, when they ought to. That is true. Um, uh, and you're right that if we think EBM on its own will fix the problem, it won't. Because as you see, um, if a whole load of trials show something, uh, people just carry on doing it because they say, well, those people were doing it in a stupid way. Uh, right, correct. So, better. so it's not a cure, but it's one part of the cure. So the other part is to not pay people, not incentivize people to make one decision other than the other. Because I think it's not that people are bad. I think it is they have bad incentives. So here in the UK, when Russia goes and presents um, uh, Orbiter around other centers in the UK, they, uh, the people sitting around go, oh, that's interesting. So it's, you know, it's only this small effect and not that. I didn't realize. And then they start talking about why it might be. They don't get angry. They don't say, you shouldn't have done that, you know, uh, because it doesn't matter to us financially. Uh, <laughs> that we have all these patients and we have essentially a limited amount of resources because that's how much tax people will pay. And every time we do one thing, there is, um, in the end, a negative impact on something else that we, we might want to do. So it's no great loss for us to get an accurate estimate of the effect size of an individual thing. Yeah, but I, I could see now maybe, uh, I mean, I don't know how it will play out in, in, uh, in Britain but, um, or in the UK, but I could see, you know, maybe the, the, uh, the overlords saying, ah, look, Orbita showed that uh, stents are no good and therefore they should never be used in uh in stable syndromes and they should be banned and uh and that's because you know it's been shown by 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 a clinical trial and therefore sense sense which i mean i think they should be used much much more rarely than they are uh right now i agree with you uh but i don't think that um they should be banned or we should say they don't work i mean the claims of ebm is that stents don't work in stable syndromes i mean you hear that that gets a uh, and maybe well, it, you're very nuanced. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so I, I get But EB, about. EBM, EBM, there's, there's an M in it, medicine. So evidence-based medicine. So it's really, it's a practice. You need to practice according to the evidence. So if you're, if you're going to, you know, if that's the claim of EBM, then, you know, really we should not, we should stop using stents in, in stable syndromes altogether. And if you say EBM is not the whole story, it's only a part of the story, then 
again, you leave the door open to judgments coming in, you know, right? So you defeat the purpose of creating something called EBM because how are we going to decide when to use EBM and when not to use EBM? It's on the basis of, of judgment and experience. And so, so, so then why bring in EBM to begin with? Yes. So, um, uh, the problem I would, I, I foresee, sorry, crazy things are happening with my uh, screen here. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of fun. So the problem is not that EBM stops you using your judgment. Um, the problem is we have too simplistic a view of what it can do for us. So we kind of expect it to tell us what to do in the case of every patient. And the classic example is FFR. I would read you um, a section from the book, the Bible of FFR, the coronary physiology. Which is now stuck under your computer. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's under my computer, and I haven't memorized it yet. Um, but uh, now, now there's an example of something that you can criticize, and I will join in, that how is it possible for, uh, I mean, how is it possible for there to be a single number which God has implanted inside the coronary arteries, in fact, in every point of every artery, conveniently, and uh, just revealed it, uh, like Joseph Smith revealing the golden plaques for Nico pills to go up and translate from the angel language into English and Dutch and Justin Davis to go up and translate into IFR language and convey it to us. And that number tells us the risk benefit ratio for that patient uh, in a perfect way. It includes how calcified and terrible and risky the lesion is. It includes somehow whether the patient is diabetic. Somehow it knows whether the patient is going to adhere to the uh, antiplatelet regime and whether they are at high bleeding risks. And it also knows that thing which you and I try to extract from our patients but have great difficulty doing non-invasively, their preference. Because once we start talking to them, we're imposing our preference on them. But somehow, the FFR extracts that from the inside. And I find that so amazing, as if I wanted to pick a counter example for EBM, it would be the thought that there is a number that tells you whether to stent or not stent, and when you stent someone on one side that you shouldn't, uh, it's a crime. Uh, and uh, so I would say that EBM is trying to make sure that we have a reasonable estimate of how effective our therapies are and our diagnostic techniques are that are not based on just asking a famous person. Because when I was in medical school, by and large, you got information by going to the library and reading a book uh, or uh, speaking to a famous person. And after all, books are written by famous people and uh, things they say get quoted. Uh, so uh, that used to be how we acquired information. And the concept of EBM is we're not going to do that. Right. But, you know, when you say EBM, uh, you know, is a way to get a reasonable estimate or a reasonable. So reasonable it's subject to judgment and opinion, right? So what's yeah. reasonable for you may be unreasonable for another. I think you and I actually, if we were to compare our practice styles, I know, we'd probably be very close. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm but, sure we do actually the same thing. It's how we describe what we do. Right, but... But I think it's... it's, it's it, 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 there's a danger in um, using even... For example, I, th I think stents are overused, you know. Uh -huh. There's a very, to me, a very important, a, a big danger in using, uh, claiming that people should use less stents on the basis of a clinical trial, right? I can see reasons, I mean, I, mean, I can, I hope that I can convince people that they shouldn't use stents as much as they use, not on the basis of clinical trials, but on the basis of good, clinical principles the trouble right. is that yes. the reason that the principles are dangerous uh -huh. is that um uh, uh is that well so john cleland no john cleland big heart failure expert he once honored me by asking him to uh, co-author an editorial on the astronaut trial uh which is about diabetes and 
uh, complicated stuff. And uh, uh, I sort of tried to contribute, but I found it was a very, very complicated stuff, which he'd written very, very elegantly, explaining some subtle, surprising finding of the thing. And uh, so I bumped into him and I said, John, thank you very much for including me. This is a very convincing story you wrote that explained the results of trial. Had it been the other way around, would you have been able to have thought of an ex uh, explanation? And he thought for about 10 seconds said, yes. And then he did, gave his explanation. <laughs> That's the problem. So um, uh, if, if the trial never existed, he would have been able to produce an, uh, an argument either way round, which would have sounded very convincing. It had lots of references and diagrams and those things with arrows going here, there and everywhere, lots of arrows. And I guess you and I would just have to believe it. Um, and his twin brother could write an equally persuasive story the other right. way around. But, but those, are, that's the, those are not the principles that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about very simple principles like... Um, be careful, you know, if the patient is, in, is asymptomatic, you know, it's going to be very hard to improve on an asymptomatic patient. You know, that's a, sort of an old uh, adage, you know, it's hard to improve on an asymptomatic patient. Right. Um, for you know, on the, for, I mean, let's, let's stick with the stance. So on the basis of experience, we know that people survive having advanced coronary disease as long as they're stable. You can have triple vessel disease and live 20 years and die of cancer or something else or, you know. So we know and that. I mean, with a primary angioplasty, I hope you had a quiet night last night, did you? I did, I did. Really? I think, uh, so you know, I, I told people that, you know, there's, until we have a, a sham trial of uh, PCI in STEMI, that really we shouldn't, <laughs> you know. No, we do anything. So, so the emergency room has been very quiet. They haven't bothered me. They're, they're you know, just giving the stemmy the aspirin. The and rolling for the sham trial of PPCI. <laughs> right, yeah. Very wise. Because the reason we know PPCI and fibrinolysis is good is there have been trials which use mortality as endpoints. So when you have something that is there to prevent death, uh, it doesn't matter so much whether it's, whether it's blinded or not. Uh, However, if you're trying to do something that is relieving symptoms, then we need to be a much more careful because we persuade the patient and the persuade patient persuades us back that anything we do is good. And it's an assay of our skill as a doctor, the right. human skill, and not the technical skill. Correct. It's fascinating. I think, I, think, I think that's right. So I, I, I don't, I'm glad the study was done. I think it it's, uh, it's provides information about the placebo effect, and I think that's great. Well, um, hang on, wait a second. Yes. No, it doesn't. No, okay. it doesn't. All right, tell no, me. It doesn't. So here's, here's, me. <laughs> here's what it is. So I, I'm not contradicting you on purpose. So right. I, I'm just pointing out that when you do a placebo controlled trial, um, you're not trying to measure the placebo effect. Because if you think about it, say the ACME trial, and I keep coming back to that because in this trial, which was a trial of plain balloon angioplasty, which gave people six months. Uh, to get restenosis before they had the, you know, the, uh, the follow-up exercise test. And also, um, uh, the medical arm got lots more antianginals than the PCI arm, the balloon arm. So there were three reasons why it is much worse uh, chances to work. And yet, it saw a 96-second more improvement in the active arm than in the control arm. And when we did it in Orbiter, we only got a 16 second. The difference between those um, was that in ACME, people knew when they had the procedure. And uh, there was a large placebo effect. In, um, in Orbiter, we didn't give people, no patient got the clinical experience of an angioplasty, which is you go into the cath lab, you have all the stuff, you have the drapes, you have the procedure, and then Michel Lacard says, look at this, see this little tiny one pixel. Look, we have to zoom in. <laughs> it's a high HD screen, and it's just one pixel on that, yeah? And now look at it, see? Right. It's like the widest bit of the artery, slightly oversized, but it's, it's the widest part of the artery is this. This is going to be great. You're going to feel fantastic. Uh, you may get the odd aches and pains anywhere in your body. It could be in the chest, could be anywhere, but it's nothing to do with your heart. And that is what gave people 
80 seconds more than we were able to deliver because we never did that in Orbiter. We said, okay, you had your procedure. Good news, you didn't die during the procedure. And then they go, so what happened? Yeah, I don't know. Nobody <laughs> can talk to. Uh, so all we tested was the, um, the biological effect directly through the coronary artery. We couldn't test the effect of having a stent that acts through the brain and the understanding interpretation of symptoms that we all have such great difficulty with. So if you have someone with coronary disease, uh, so if you have someone with chest pain, and you know they have a tight lesion, we automatically link the two together, of course. Um, but they may not be related. <laughs> right, but, but uh, let me give you, I mean, pertaining to this, two real life examples. I have two patients, uh, recent in my practice, uh, recent experience. Both of them are you know, healthy males. One of them is 60, but very youthful looking, you know, 60 year old. Uh, who started having uh, um, uh, angina, uh, jogging. He loves to jog. You know, it's hilly around here in the Bay Area. He, he jogs up the mountains, and he started having angina on jogging. We did a treadmill te- I did a treadmill test. Um, no high-risk features. You know, uh, angina or ST depression uh, a little bit in stage th- uh, three of the Bruce protocol and so forth. I have another patient who also has stable exertional angina, 39 years old, and um, uh, similar, uh, sort of uh, low-risk uh, treadmill stress test. I chose to treat one, to send one to angiogram and PCI, and I chose to treat the other one medically, right? Even though, on, on objectively, they look pretty much the same. But I, I, my clinical judgment was that this one patient, the 60-year-old, would do better, would feel better, you know, whatever it is, would do better. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he may have stent thrombosis, you know, God knows. I mean, it's possible. But overall, I thought he would do better and he would accept. And I, and I could sense, I don't know if I had, you know, there was shared medical decision-making because I don't really... Uh, believe too much in that concept. I think we influence uh, our, our patients and we should. That's also a brilliant point. That's right. also a brilliant point. So, because so I made the decision for him because this is what patients come to doctors to, you know, for, right? So uh, They wanted to, have, to and have a procedure. They right. Would do. Yeah. So I didn't put the stand myself. I sent him to, to uh, I, I don't do this in my private practice. I, I just sent to, to, um, to an angioplast, you know, to, to have an angiogram and uh, he had a, a mid LED lesion and he was stenosed and now he's back running. The other one I'm treating medically and his angina is much better with, okay. I, I don't know what will happen to either one of them. You know, may, I, I may, you know, it, maybe these are wrong decisions. Maybe the, the guy with the stent is going to have stent thrombosis. Maybe the, the guy with no. uh, being managed medically, who, who knows? But I think well, it's... Uh, if he has a stent thrombosis, we know right. that the net effect is neutral. You're perfectly safe on terms of events. Right. There's a little bit of a periprocedural risk. And if they get past that, there's a slightly better long-term state. Yeah. But, but for him, if he has a stent thrombosis, he's not going to think that it's neutral. <laughs> he's going to be... Uh, but but I mean, the point is, let, let's say that I'm right. Let's say that I did correctly. Let's say that I really, for, for, for the guy who got the stent, it was really the best thing to do. And yeah. for the guy who was managed medically, it was the best thing for him to get, let's say that that's the case. Uh, I think what I'm concerned is that if we teach or preach EBM the way it's preached, somebody right now will say nobody gets the, the, the stand, they all get treated medically and so forth. And, and I think we, we, we lose, we lose, um, um, you know, I mean, and perhaps, I mean, I don't know, maybe the, the guy who, you know, my 60 year old, I was concerned that him being on the, on the trail on the trails in the hills of San Francisco, he might perhaps push himself a little bit too much, have more scheme. You know, who knows? I don't know. I, I don't have any evidence, but I don't know that there's any trial that would, you no, know, change, change my decisions so, here, right? The, the trials the are not going to change my... Data, the vast amount of data that's uh, accumulated so far and the 5,000 patients in ischemia uh, will add to that and I, I suspect is likely to continue the same trend of neutrality tells you that, yes, you worry about one thing, you worry about an infarct, um, a natural spontaneous infarct, and then on the other hand, you worry about uh, serious complications from the stenting. What 
the evidence tells us is actually don't worry. So when you say you worry, I say, I, I, that's actually one thing I don't worry about uh, because it's about equal. If those vast number of patients, um, thousands, and uh, with the scheme, I think it's about 8,000 in total once you put them together with the existing ones. Um, if it's about equal, then we need to stop worrying about events in, in that sense. Death rate is very low and tends to be non-cardiac. And um, uh, myocardial infarction rates are very low in people who are adherent, the sorts of people in trials. So the, uh, the question actually is how to advise them. And you're absolutely right. Um, there is, we shouldn't advise them based on evidence-based medicine because that is only, I mean, <laughs> if, if, uh, if one side is going to be uh, higher mortality. So if someone comes in and say, with an ST elevation at MI and they don't want to have uh, an angiogram or thrombolysis, then you use evidence-based medicine to hit them over the head and kind of say, look, this is a life right, and death thing. Right, right. Right. So, uh, but when uh, evidence-based medicine gives you the reassurance that events are about equal, then uh, by far the most important thing is the patient's preference, by far. And you're absolutely right, there's no way to get it. There's almost no way that we can establish that because the moment you open your mouth, the moment you start to talk about anything, you have already spun them, either sort of clockwise into a stent or right. anti-clockwise into medical therapy. So right. if you say, even if you use the same words, so you could say, we could put a stent. And, uh, or you could say, well, we could put a stent. And at the same words in a different intonation, uh, get them spinning in one way or another. And you made an excellent point that we pretend it's a shared decision-making. But what, what I think we should be trying to do is assay as early as possible when they're naive to your opinion, what is their preference? Are they worried about, uh, are they worried about something happening to them because there's something wrong with the heart? Would they feel reassured with a stent? Uh, are they really perturbed? And uh, would they be reassured by having a stent and then being told that of the various pains, the angina has gone away, so don't worry about the remaining pains? Or are they the sort of people which a lot of people say, well, I'd rather have less than more if it's about even. And uh, I can always come and have it later. Absolutely fine by me as well. But you, you put your finger on the, 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 the key point here, which is EBM can't tell you what to do. So the purpose of EBM is to stop us having a blanket, um, blanket policy by Dr. Onsteger et al. Um, I'm not allowed to pick on people by name. Uh, by order of Dr. al -Lamu. But, uh, you know, uh, you saw on the video how a certain person was very, very motivated to prove the point that death and MI were improved and he wanted high-quality cardiologists. I felt really bad. Well, I went, every time he said high-quality cardiologists, I felt like maybe I'm not in that. Maybe I'm not. That. Who knows? Maybe he doesn't want me. Maybe it's a clue. But uh, the high-quality cardiologists had to get involved in this trial and uh, prove that death and MI are reduced. If, if it was true that death and MI were reduced, then I think we would be pushing a lot of people into having it. And that's a good thing. We should be doing things. We, we should be able to tell them that actually it doesn't have much effect on death, but it could prevent a heart attack. And, you know, out of 50 heart attacks, we can prevent, say, 10. Uh, that's but, a but, useful piece. But even, even, the, even there, I'm going to push back even further because even if... Uh, you know, an intervention, let's take the statins, for example. Yeah. Even if uh, statins, you know, reduce events, you, you can also, as a clinician, come up with a reason why, you know, you're going to, in general, it's not that I, I don't push it or offer it, but I may respect, you know, a patient's, you know, I mean, right now, there's they're, 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 they're a phobia, which is not a phobia that comes from me, it's a phobia that comes from Mm, you know, the, newspaper. The and so forth and newspaper and so um, there's a phobia um, but I think the phobia in part has been again because of overuse of statins also using claims of EBM you know so, well, the thing is, so, 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 so statins I think are both overused and underused so there, there's a misallocation and EBM hmm. gets used gets thrown into the mix and it doesn't do anything to the 
judicious reallocation, which can only happen on the basis of good clinical judgment. And so well, I would what we should foster is, is good clinical judgment. The system imp impairs, you know, there are sy systemic problems that have nothing to do with the data of science or medical science that have to do with the way we practice, the fact that people, doctors are unaccountable. In many ways, patients are also unaccountable because somebody else is footing the bill and so forth. So yeah, to me, these are, smoking, yeah, you know, so, correct, bad. correct. So, so these are big problems. It's going to be, I mean, I don't want to get into them here. It's, 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 it's tangential, hmm. but, but, you know, there are many EBM purists that view EBM as the solution to problems that are, have a totally different cause. And in that sense, it's distracting. And it, to me, it's, it, if we take it at face value, if we use EBM to make recommendations, then it's going to be an, impover an, an impoverishment of clinical judgment. You know, whatever is left of clinical judgment is going to be even further imp impoverished. So I think if, if I hear you correctly, there is reason to do very good clinical trials. And I agree with you. So there's reason to, go, to provide very good evidence. So we need the E. E, the uh -huh. e is fine, but the BM is what well, I don't want any BMs, no BMs in my, <laughs> <laughs> but the is, in my practice. The problem, yeah. We need the evidence and uh, we need to understand uh, when you're applying it to the patient, quite often the thing that matters most is the patient's preference. And that is not built into yeah. EBM. I would, uh, let me be a little more nuanced. The, the patient's preference. It's not so much the preference, the way I see it is more what is best because the, the patients may have the wrong, you know, their preference okay. may, be, may be biased, equally biased. And so you, it's complicated. Well, preference isn't a, it's, 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 it's not their express preference. It's right. not necessarily their express preference. All right. Because if you give them a menu, right. they will just either pick at random or pick right. what you, they think you want them to pick. Yeah, yeah, like the conversation, would you like a cabbage or would you like BCI? You know, you have multiple. <laughs> yes, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, of course. And right. if presented by a cardiologist, they will yeah. always go, go right. uh, for a PCI. So then, you know, when they have a left main stem and tight RCA and all that, and uh, so you say, well, okay, yes. Uh, so if you think that a cabbage is the best thing, then you should express that to them right. in no uncertain terms. Don't give them a choice, one of which is bad, because uh, uh, let them force you if they really don't want to have a seat. Um, but uh, I think the key thing about uh, the evidence is that the evidence provides you with estimates. First of all, it, find, it provides you an S, uh, it gives you a list of therapies which have never been shown to improve endpoints um, that matter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually very helpful because it, you could delete them all from your consideration. So uh, in the terms of stenting for stable angina, I have now almost completely deleted stents for prevention of death and MI. Um, so I, if I see someone with coronary did artery you, disease... Did you really believe that stents would prevent death and MI? Yes. I mean, for how long? I mean, I think, you know, I stopped believing I that. Maybe. I call it Vogel's demon. So, you know, a Maxwell's demon in physics. Mm -hmm. The idea that if you have a little hole, just for the viewers watching, you have a little hole between two boxes, you could have a little um, a tiny monster sitting at the hole between uh, separating two boxes. And every time a gas atom goes one way, he could open the door and let the gas through. And every time it's going the other way, he shuts it. And so by doing so, he can accumulate all the gas in one side of the box. And so he reverses entropy and, you know, destroys the universe. <laughs> um, so uh, Richard Bogle, who you probably see on uh, one of my friends, uh, we train together in London, um, uh, introduced me the concept of his demon, which is when you see someone with uh, an acute STEMI, if the day before, if you had stented that lesion, he wouldn't have had that STEMI. And that's reasonable to say, probably, you know, with the artery. And so Bogle's demon is basically an interventionist that goes around the day before you have a piece, uh, a STEMI, and stents you. And that would be, in principle, that would work. So because Bogle's demon could do it, maybe there's a way that we could do it in reality. So there's a potential, it could work. I mean, if we right. made the procedure totally safe, we could do a Bogle's demon type phenomenon. That reminds me, um, of, 
yeah. I was looking for honourable Clark. I mean, the most boring lectures <laughs> in any Congress is always, you know, the vulnerable Clark, the time has come. And I, you know, from the time I was a baby, I would go there and it would be the same or well, same or different guys talking about pressure, temperature. Right. Yeah. So you, you know what the definition of a vulnerable plaque is? No. The one that has a stent in it. <laughs> so, so, so uh, but but you 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 bring up the I mean people were talking about vulnerable plaques. Yeah, I have been talking about it for fifteen years now. Because it's a great story. Yeah, but that, correct. But but, but what I'm saying is that we know we know that a tight lesion is not the whole story. Yeah. You know, in a way, we know, we, we've known that for a while. And we've known that we come across people who've had, who have had tight lesions and we discover them completely incidentally, you know, and, and they probably have had it for well, years. Well, you do a primary angioplasty and there's significant right. lesions elsewhere. How did that happen? How did they end up with type 3 vessel right. disease and come in only today? So, you know. so we, we, know that, we know that we don't understand this beast, coronary disease. That is, it's really mysterious. And therefore... Uh, a clinical principle, a good clinical principles from my point of view would be that in, in, with coronary disease, you need to be very circumspect. You need mm -hmm. to, you know, be cautious, not move in with, uh, you know, your armamentarium because, because you don't know. And yes, you know, clinical trials are helpful, but I think a lot, of, a lot of the information can also, a lot of the information of the relevant information you can get just from case series, from honestly, carefully done, long experiences, case series. Yes, of course, you'll have a mix of patients, you won't, but you'll understand the natural history of things, you know, better. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're very good. Case series are right. very, very good right. if you're trying to establish natural history, risk factors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so they are perfect. So my um, campaign against observational studies is, and I know sometimes people get a bit hurt and they say, oh no, but you know, observations can be quite good. And I said, no, no, they're very good. And when I, whenever they, the people that argue back in favor of observational studies with me on Twitter are actually people who do them. And when you look, they're not actually doing them to make therapeutic judgments. They're establishing natural history in very large groups of people, progressions of change in prognosis over time, that kind of thing. Um, uh, where, where it completely comes apart is if you try to make a treatment decision based on things you've seen in observational studies. Right. Sometimes Correct. it turns out to be right, but sometimes it's caused by something. True, true, but, but that's true. You know, I think we've established that fact that treatment decisions are bad, you know, no matter what. I mean, they're bad. You cannot make them on the basis of ABM and you cannot make them on the basis of observational study. You can never, well, make, but safer, it doesn't mean, so. You're much safer making them on the basis of EBM on experiments as opposed to uh, associations you see. Because yeah, if you look I, at right. them, all kinds of nonsense was talked about them. Yeah. They were thought to be deadly when, uh, if in the case where, so in non-cardiogenic shock, the observational studies, remember this? So in, in patients, when, uh, where, when we were all putting in balloon pumps into people when we thought they were needed, so everyone uh, who had cardiogenic shock, we put a balloon pump in, obviously, unless you couldn't, and t they're really tiny, yeah. spindly vessels. And, right. and then anyone who didn't have cardiogenic shock, but you're quite worried because there was something bad about them. But the consequence of that was this. So everyone with cardiogenic shock, you'd put a balloon, except the little old lady with two millimeter vessels in the leg. You'd leave her because you didn't want to be angioplasting her aorta. Then she would die because she's a little old lady with two millimeter vessels. And you say, well, of course she died because we, didn't, we couldn't put a balloon pump in. And then the person that comes in that doesn't meet the criteria for cardiogenic shock, but is very sweaty and you're very, very anxious about them, and uh, you, you're really worried, and so you put a balloon pump into them, uh, even though they're not in cardiac shock, and then they go on and die. I, you were right to be very worried about them. Say, so, well, that they died because we put a balloon pump into someone who doesn't have cardiogenic shock. And I've been to congresses where people said that effectively without giving explanation. And that's why we wrote that paper with Yusuf Ahmed to say, um, if you're systematically putting balloon pumps into everyone with cardiac shock, except those you can't, and then a few extra ones where you're really worried, you will get this right. effect. Um, right, but 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 from it, uh, I absolutely uh, refuse to use observational experience to make uh, therapeutic judgment. Correct, but you know you, you know from experience that the uh, balloon pump is not the end all be all if if you treat enough cardiac shock patients because. You put it in many, and many die, end up dying despite your balloon pump. So it's it's not a lifesaver. So 
So it's well, a little like the, the stance, stance. We know that not from not from clinical experience. My clinical experience gives me no knowledge on uh, whether no, IAB. I've had patients oh, with the bone pumps who have gone on to die. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I have seen that come to survive. Right, but so what I'm saying is, it tells me absolutely nothing about whether the damn thing works, because it is just an association in a certain number of patients I've done, and yes. Everyone you put in a balloon pump in, the physiology gets better, doesn't it? The cardiac right. output goes up, the mean not, arterial not, pressure goes up. Yeah, not always. I mean, some people have a, a marginal response. And, and I'm not sure that they're, you know, that, that they're completely useless. I'm, I'm not convinced that they're completely useless. I mean, I could, no, maybe, I could argue, I use them less than I used to. I use them less yeah. than I used to. And that's but where evidence-based medicine comes in, because you no longer feel obliged to put it in. So the day that Yusuf and I got that paper accepted in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, uh, that day, we were all celebrating fantastic. That night, he and I, by chance or on call, cardiogenic shock. We both looked at each other and we put a balloon pump in because <laughs> uh, <laughs> everyone else would put a balloon pump in and we didn't want to be seen as crazy people. Yeah. So uh, it's one of those things where you, uh, you now feel a lot more comfortable. You and I could not put a balloon pump in if we wanted to by um, active kind of mental power we can do it but you know what the medical students today are laughing at us See, that old guy he puts in balloon pumps uh, when he sees cardiogenic shock as a matter of routine i think he probably puts a four-leaf clover on the patient's head as well <laughs> so yeah, it's but, but, very difficult right. for us to change our beliefs and behaviors but the next generation can do it right and they will the evidence-based medicine they see that thrombolysis is better than nothing they see that primary angioplasty is better than thrombolysis and they see that as a good thing that we have contributed how long did it take you to stop recommending antibiotics for um uh routine prophylaxis with uh, endocarditis with valves it took you a long time i bet but i would i would never have recommended them in the first place if it wasn't for top down people telling me that i should that i should yeah, give them sure. Right. Non evidence based medicine. Right. Because the very first, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, so so <laughs> evidence based medicine overturned the eminence based medicine. The good, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you see people who have endocarditis on a diseased valve, and yes, they've been to the dentist in the last six months, like everyone else on earth. Yeah. And say, <laughs> so, oh, wow, it must have been that. It, it took a long time in this patient. And then when they actually go and study it, they find that when you brush your teeth, it releases right. more bacteria than right. when the dentist drills in one point. So uh, uh, you're actually making the case for evidence-based medicine. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, the, 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 the practice to give antibiotics to everybody was sold to me from, on the basis of some kind of epidemiologic no, it evidence. So, uh, yeah, definitely not. I, I'll, I'll dig it, it up and talk because it, uh, it, it was based on it makes sense. And lots of things make sense. It just turns out to be right. what the actual evidence, the experiments they did, two experiments. One was patients, I remember this is about 15 years ago. It was my first presentation as a medical student. So I, I remember. So one experiment was they, um, they randomized people at high risk who were undergoing an operation and they found no difference. Then they, the, the crazy opera thing was people who'd had an attack of endocarditis in the past they randomized them to antibiotics or not and found no different. Uh, and, th and that's what uh, was the more definitive answer because they were the ultimate in high risk. So now we accept that these guys are having showers of, anti uh, of bacteria going around all the time. And things like dental work are no more than every day. So yes, you can do it but the dental work, but then you may as well give it continuously every day. Um, and if you don't think the latter is valuable, there's no reason to pick the day that you go to the dentist as the day to take it. You could do it on one of the other days instead. Right. Uh, okay. I, I can see that. Um, but would I, you know, if somebody wanted to give antibiotics, I mean, do we? No, I, I let them. Because I, yeah. you, you right. always let them. Because, uh, and if a patient in the past has had it and they say, oh, right. shall I have it? Then I say, yes, go ahead. Because yeah. the last thing you want to do is shake right. this. Exactly. Difference, <laughs> which is based on so little. The fact that, you know, you have like certificates behind you. I don't. I have it. Right. So when the patients come and see you, they see that you're actually a doctor. They don't know. Right. And so, uh, so uh, I don't change my mind. So the evidence is very good. I agree with you. We need evidence and it's, we need very good evidence and, and good evidence. Uh, but again, it's not evidence-based medicine, meaning it's, it, it's not going to compel me 
you know, it shouldn't compel me or, or restrict me or remove my degrees of freedom. You know, no, I, I should, think that's wrong. Right. We should keep, the idea is to keep your freedom and allow it to be exercised with the knowledge of what the patient would want, your interpretation of what the patient would want, and without a financial incentive one mm-hmm. way or the other. Which is if you have a financial incentive, that just trumps, every, it's like level zero. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone's going to give you money, <laughs> then you do that thing. Sorry, right. that's why people go to work in the morning. Right, you know? but, that, but that's the entire system under which we work. And, and in uh, fact, and it's, and it's the entire, it's the cause of the problems that I think many EBM purists are trying to remedy um, uh, with EBM, which I think is, is, is sort of uh, displaced. It's a, it's a, you know, yes, you know. It's there, not going to fix, you're, you're right. absolutely right. If there's a problem of overuse, uh, by the way, I thought you're in, are you in Canada or in the States? In the States. Oh, right. I wondered what the hell you were talking about. Because in Canada, it's a bit more like the UK system, isn't it? Yes, yes. There isn't such a strong yeah. gradient to, uh, to over-practice, yeah. Um, uh, right, so it, it, yes, I think absolutely right. And I think the EBM people, the most prominent EBM people, actually are the Hamilton, Ontario people, the Dave Sackett. Yes, of course. Because it, 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 <laughs> it, uh, EBM, EBM is, is, is very useful for a single-payer system. Yes, EBM yes. is very useful, and it came. It, it's a sort of a, it's a natural outgrowth from a single payer system. You where you have a limited amount of money, you want to know what is useful way of spending that money for the population. And you don't really care about the individual prerogatives of the doctor or the patient. You want to care about the population, and that mm-hmm. to me is the tragedy. Really, it really is. Mm-hmm. Um, is the tragedy that we try and do the best for the population at large? Uh, yes, I, if it comes at the at the expense of you know the health of the individual patients yes it is and it it yeah. doesn't it doesn't work we've grown uh, to that in, in the uk though we've grown accustomed to that but um if there is something fantastic that could cure you as an individual but it would cause all these people to not get hip replacements say then there is a trade-off and uh, those people may get their hip replacements and you not get a thing that is very expensive and we've come to terms with that. So several generations of government tried to pretend there was no rationing. But we have there gra- is correct. But when you say we've come to terms, we've come to accept. Yes, I agree. But whether it actually, uh, you know, I mean, the calculus is the, calcu- the utilitarian calculation is arbitrary. I mean, you know, oh, yes, yes. It's, it's all made up. It's all made up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Only death is uh, kind of, I mean, have you ever seen a cost effectiveness analysis saying? Yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so the moment you read a thing saying cost effectiveness analysis of you go okay so it was positive you can actually cite it in a lecture right. knowing it was positive without even reading the title or abstract right um but so you, you know, know it, but but uh, ebm plays in the hands of people who do cost effectiveness analysis and who believe in that and so forth mm-hmm. and and that's that's the problem especially as we become you know more and more uh decision making is becoming more and more centralized um, it is in the in the UK to some extent. It is even more in Canada. Uh, mm-hmm. It is becoming more so in in the US, and that it, it, for the future is going to be a big problem. We don't realize it because it's really it's an opportunity cost. Um, mm-hmm. yes. The freedom that clinicians have had, even with the bad incentives, um, to tinker with clinical practice here and the bad there were there are clearly bad incentives so i'm not i'm not lauding the u.s system i think i think it's terrible Mm -hmm. but nevertheless there's been a lot of freedom here that has really generated tremendous innovations whether you like them or not Uh, they have and they've benefited places like the uk and canada for example angioplasty in acute mi was done by uh, herzl uh, you know complete without any evidence base whatsoever you know, he was a, uh, a cath cowboy and he did this, but he really opened the door to doing angioplasties and acute mice, which is now is recognized as the, the best thing. So he used his freedom, he used his clinical judgment, but right now we're moving with EBM, we're moving to a system where all the fellows, all the trainees are just looking to the guidelines, are just looking to the randomized trials to tell them what to do. And they're, they're, they're told to distrust their judgment you know their opinion and i think that's damaging so to me that's that's the most damaging thing um in the long term and, and i think well, we, i think what know, we should be edu- well i'm glad i would rather they use the trials than ask 
the bald guy in the corner who's their <laughs> boss uh, because uh, I think that's a better starting point. Yeah, uh, except that now the bald guy in the corner is, is preaching the trials. You know, that's, you know, the academia now has become sort of, is, 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 EBM has become the new dogma. So, yes. so if it was eminence-based medicine before, and it had its shortcoming, it's been replaced yeah. by a, a new kind of dogma, which is EBM. And, and so, so... It's not a terrible thing, as long as people are allowed to vary from it, but realize that, you know, if you say, right, balloon pumps are neutral, but I think I can select, uh, you know, mortality, but I can select the patients who will really benefit. Uh, and that's what I, I actually believe that. But I actually know it's not Good. true. I'm glad you're, you're saying that. I believe it, but I actually know it's not true. It's like... You know it's not true but from, your, from your judgment. And maybe you have good clinical judgments in saying that it's not true, but you don't know that it's not true on the basis of, of, uh, of no, the, the, clinical the, the, trial the, the evidence. Not, For example, the, the, if, I, if I say, if I have a good emergency room and I'm going to say, we're going to use the balloon pump right when they hit the door, you know, yeah. in the emergency room, and maybe that will make a difference. I mean, why not? I mean, it could possibly make a difference if you put the, the balloon pump, right? It could. Yeah, but, I, but I you know, have... I would have thought the way they did it in the trial would have worked as well. That's the right. thing. Right. So, uh, so the reason I, so I have a feeling that it is beneficial in the patients I personally select. But the trials were pretty, you know, didn't, people didn't randomize people who they thought wouldn't benefit. So just like, right, like in orbit, right, right. Um, people now are saying, oh, you random people you designed to fail. Right. If anyone says design, I'm going to slap them. <laughs> I'm going to slap them. Who designs a trial to fail? What idiot goes through? And, uh, you know, Russia wouldn't spend her life doing a trial designed to fail. It was a trial designed to succeed. It just happened to have right. uh, the effect size was smaller than we thought. Um, so uh, the, in the trials, people recruit people who they think will show a difference between the right, two arms. Right, right. And um, so if they as a group were unable to do it, maybe I think I'm above average, just like I think um, my partner starts most of my, the arguments in our household and uh, that I'm a better than average driver, uh, but probably I'm not. You're not, um, you're, probably, you're right, you're right. But uh, uh, again, it's a tangent, but in a sane world, in a sane world, um, you know, the... the the patient would pay for the cost of care. It would be much yes. cheaper because if they had to pay for the cost of care, things would be cheaper because we'd have to. And then, and then you'd, be, you'd be very cautious about using equipment that's expensive because, yeah. you know, you'd, you'd take that into account, you know. Yeah, they'd be saying, this right. 256 slice CT you're going to do. What's the lowest number of right. slices you can do? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> <With a 16. laughs> uh, so, yes, you're right. And if people were paying... Uh, but the, the problem with health is people say, oh, it's my health. So, you know, uh, I'm Priceless. happy to right. part with the money. And uh, I try and tell them, I try and advise them. Uh, uh, so I see private patients too, occasionally. Uh, and I, I'm not very good at, at it because I'm not very nice. I tell them the, the private patients don't pay. I mean, in your, I mean they, they have insurance, so somebody else is paying. Yes, no, exactly. Right, right. So. Uh, some, some are self-paying. Say so if they're from outside the UK. Um, they were paying. And I try to advise them like I would advise my own family in another country. So I don't advise them to do every possible test there is. Right. It's only things that will really make a difference to their, uh, to treatments that mm -hmm. they have. So for example, if someone is worried about cardiovascular risk and, um, you know, they have a average to high-ish cholesterol, even average cholesterol. So if someone says, uh, I'm really worried, my brother is about the same age as me has died of a heart attack, I'll give him a statin. Yeah. So I went like carotid and all of that stuff uh -huh. because uh, why should they pay to have random measurements? So in the end of the day, the only thing you can do is give them a statin. So you ask them, uh, here's a thing that will reduce your chance of uh, having a heart attack 30%. Every year you take it, it'll be about 30% lower. I actually don't know what your risk is and we could calculate it, but we could just reduce it by 30%. Take this tablet, which will cost mm -hmm. you five cents a day when you buy it, you know, generically. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to do that? And he goes, all right. So, uh, and then they say, does it have any side effects? I go, no. Uh, here's a placebo controlled trial. Uh, actually, it does increase your glucose a tiny, tiny bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, in net terms, it's beneficial. If you're happy, go ahead and take that. You're asymptomatic. You don't need to have any tests. 
Uh, and I, I kind of feel comfortable. I'm more comfortable giving a statin than giving aspirin. You know, aspirin makes holes in people. You know? So, right, right. Um, uh, uh, I, but the reason I know that is that someone has done the EBM that tells me that all the event rates get a bit less, um, and you know there is a, a reduction in all cause mortality even in the primary thing. I, uh, I right. I agree. I agree. And and it's in the interest of pharma to do the these kinds of trials. Yes, you know, and and they've done they they've done those trials, and um, and I don't think it's a conspiracy because correct, you know how difficult no, it is to keep I, anything. I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I agree. Well, uh, Professor Francis, shall we wrap it up or? We'll wrap it up. I think we're actually in practice we're doing almost the same things I, for I almost reasons. It's. It's how we, you know, you feel negative about EBM because it seems to be constricting your it's, practice. It's its policy implications. I mean, it's it's being used as a as a tool to effect yeah. social change yeah. or policy change or practice change. Yeah. Uh, but the Without. alternative, is, yeah. But my feeling is it's a tool to so certainly from a, a budget limited environment, it's a tool to funnel our resources. Uh, mm -hmm. which are not enough for all the things that are beneficial to be sure that we're spending it on, um, uh, on things that are beneficial. Having said that, did you know that you can get homeopathy on the National Health Service in the UK? Right. <laughs> I, I, it's yeah. still amazing. So, you know, that's why I don't feel bad doing stents for stable angina. <laughs> <laughs> at least it opens a vessel. And at least when I give them the faith healing at the end, it is faith healing based on science. And they get right, the 16 right. seconds from the stent <laughs> and the 80 seconds from the Michel Akkad level uh, persuasion that they can now feel relaxed and happy. Daryl, it was a pleasure. Uh, great pleasure for me too. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a good Bye. <laughs>